Hey guys, audio check. Can you hear me okay? Let me know in the chat. Good, good. How you guys doing? You guys having a good weekend? Ready for the market to open on Monday? What's up, Design Stuff, Brent, The Trademark, Ross? Always good to see you guys. I always appreciate you guys uh, commenting on my videos, as always. Just a question for you guys. Um, let me know in the comments. Uh, how long have you been trading? Like months, years, uh, or just interested in markets or anything like that? Absolutely. Stay ready. Yeah. Monday can't come around soon enough, right? Especially uh, given the circumstances the last couple days. Be interesting to see what the market does next week, huh? Two years, three years. Cool. So a variety of experience. And are you guys uh, trading mostly small caps, large caps, like beta names like myself, stocks, options, just kind of getting a feel for what you guys are uh, into? Oh, design. Yeah, what's up, man? Yeah, okay. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks for uh, yeah chiming in on the Discord there. Appreciate that. Large cap options. Nice. I figure that's probably going to be the most of you guys since you obviously are watching me trading options. But yeah, good stuff. Nice, nice. So let me ask you guys just straight up. How many of you guys are consistently profitable? Like you've uh, been able to turn a profit for, let's try small, just at least a few months. Maybe not even a whole year. Small to mid equities and large cap options. Okay, cool, Ross. Yeah, I started out uh, trying to trade small caps and pretty much got my ass handed to me. Um, if you're going to trade small caps, so definitely Jeff over at Livestream uh, Trading, he's really solid. His system for trading small caps uh, works really, really well. I just, you know, uh, for me, it, I never really felt comfortable trading companies that are just literally, you know, piece of crap companies that could go bankrupt any day and. I, I don't know for some reason it, it's mental but it's huge psychological is everything in trading and for me I feel completely comfortable putting money into stocks like Apple Netflix etc last three months have been flat small profit okay well that's cool so you're kind of if you watched my um, journey and day trading you're you, you kind of lose money and then you trade flat and then you start to figure it out so you're probably in that kind of flat stage that's a good place to be it can be frustrating, but that that shows that you're making progress, right? So that's a good place to be. Not quite there. I had a couple of green months, then red and such. Let my emotions get the best of me. Yep, emotions are everything for sure. Uh, that's why you switch to light speed. One of that max loss just in case, yeah. And that's not a bad idea. What he's talking about is uh, having the broker put a, a max loss on your account. So essentially, if it's say like five hundred dollars, if if you uh, realize five hundred dollars uh, um, on the day a loss, they will uh, lock your account and not let you trade anymore for the rest of the day. They won't actually close the position for you, so you'll still have to do that. But um, it is a nice feature if um, you know if you're still struggling with uh, discipline. On the short side, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Cool. Well, I thought what we'd talk about today is uh, obviously if you guys have any questions at all during the video about trading, investing, whatever the case may be, um, you know, feel free to ask that. I'll, I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. 
I pulled a couple of uh, common questions that I get from my uh, YouTube videos that I'll just address in the video. So if it helps you guys out or anyone who's watching after who can't be here live. Um, thought we'd just quickly run over my dividend portfolio, my retirement accounts if you guys are interested in the investing side of things. And then we'll also just kind of talk about trading uh, the market charts, uh, my Tastyworks account. We'll see where that stands. And um, uh, let's see, I've also got some spreadsheets that I want to share with you guys. It's kind of like a bonus just to say thank you for you guys subscribing to the channel, coming to the live stream. Um, I'm going to share my spreadsheet for investing. I've got a spreadsheet. Uh, it's like a monthly P&L tracker that you can use. And I've also got a, an investment allocation calculator spreadsheet. So I'll, I'll put links to all of that in the description of the video below so you guys can um, access that. It is through Google Sheets. So what you're going to do is if you have an account with Google, which pretty much I think everyone does, you'll be able to essentially make a copy of the spreadsheet. You can edit it and do whatever you want with it from there. Uh, Ross, the music is Epidemic Sound. Let me just pull it up real quick for you. It's Epidemic Sound, and it's like uh, you pay uh, a fee, like annual fee or monthly fee, whatever, um, and you get uh, access to this music that you can use on your YouTube channel. Um, and it's, uh, what do you call it, uh, royalty-free, I guess. So I can... Uh, I can advertise with the with the music and I don't get copyright strikes or anything. It's just put together a little playlist uh, for the live stream here and uh, it's the same music that I use in my in my videos as well so. Yeah, no worries. All right, so uh, first of all, why don't we just start with the investment stuff and then we'll pop over to talk about trading. Um, let me just pull up. So this is the spreadsheet that I'm going to share with you guys. Um, it's a very highly customized spreadsheet. I was trying to make a version of it that's a little little bit more of like a template version um, because everyone's situation is, is going to be kind of unique. But um, I made a lot of changes and I'm not really a spreadsheet expert, but I was able to figure out quite a bit of stuff. Um, I changed, I moved all of this information over here. Let me just pull up my drawing tools to make it a little bit easier. All right, so over here, all of this over here was kind of like up at the top, but if you don't have a really tall monitor, it kind of compressed everything in this in the uh, in the screen there. So I moved it over here. The downside of that is is if you guys use this spreadsheet and you come in here and like start adding rows to add your investments to specific sectors, um, it's going to basically add rows here. So what I had to do, it's not perfect, but just kind of highlight all of this and then cut it. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do that with this uh, open. Let me close this. There we go. So you can highlight all of this here. You can uh, cut it and then just move it out of the way. Add your rows. You know, you can come in here and you know insert a row. Whatever you need to do, add all of your rows uh, into each of the sectors. And then once you're done, you can just come down here and cut this back up here. So it's not ideal, but this is not something you're going to be doing very often, right? Uh, this is supposed to be for long-term investing, so ideally you're not going to be changing up your positions too much. But um, I will share a link with this um, uh, in just a bit. I'll put it in the description for you guys. And you, like I said, you can access it uh, through Google Sheets. If you go to File, and then you're going to go to Make a Copy right there. And then you'll be able to save it to your Google Drive, and you'll be able to edit it and all that stuff. But yeah, what I did is, um, of course, I have the market gain. Um, it's all calculated based on, obviously, your, your positions in the spreadsheet, your return. I changed it so the market gain is not adding in the earned dividends. So this is just purely the, uh, the market gain. Um, this is the lifetime earned dividends on the portfolio. And this is how much the portfolio is making every year in, in dividends. And obviously, that's going to fluctuate based on the dividend yield, which dividend yields fluctuate all the time. So... I tend to update it every couple months or something like that, but it gives you a you know a pretty good idea of about how much um, passive income the portfolio is generating. And then again, down here, I talked about this before, but this is just giving you an idea of how to essentially balance your portfolio. Anything that's in red means you're underweight, so you need to invest that amount in that particular sector based on the allocation that you input here. 
anything in green, you're overweight, technically you're supposed to sell, but it is a taxable account. So anytime you sell a position, you create a taxable event. So I'm not really interested in selling. Again, this is supposed to be very long-term, but it gives you an idea of how to dynamically balance your portfolio in the same way that M1 Finance automatically did it for you. Like I said, I loved M1 Finance, but I just, I wanted that full control of order executions and plus everything was at Fidelity. So it just consolidated everything there. Uh, let's see. Um, and then over here, I put this big pie chart in. So this gives you a percentage look of each of the companies in the portfolio. So you can see exactly how much weight each of the companies is. Um, so it's just kind of a good graphic to see. Uh, on this tab is where you input your monthly dividends earned. So I started uh, this portfolio in March, I guess. So you can see the dividends slowly increasing every month that goes by. Um, and then this is just a data page and this is really used for this pie chart here. Uh, so I just input uh, each of my holdings in the portfolio and uh, it uh, obviously uses that data for the pie chart here um, just talking in terms of the holdings um, I don't know if you guys were around for the test live stream or anything I haven't made a video update on the portfolio in a little while I did buy Disney I picked it up just after their earnings uh, picked it up around hundred dollars a share I really loved that price point because it was like a the bottom end of a huge support area for years and year I think about three years or so of support on Disney in fact, we can look at the chart really quick. That might be helpful. Uh, let's go to a daily chart and we'll actually change this over to a monthly chart. It's a little bit easier to see, right? So look right here between 90 and $100. You have all of this the support where it was trading from like what, 2015 through 2019. So several years. I like that $100 to $90 area. So that's where I picked that up. Let's see, let me open that again. So I picked up Google again on a pullback. Uh, my first entry point before those shares got liquidated on the transfer to Fidelity was a great entry, so I hated that. Um, up just a little bit on that position. Otherwise, nothing changed in the communications sector. Um, a new addition to consumer discretionary, I picked up Ralph Lauren. Um, I, I was up like 30% on it, but with the market pulling back the past couple of days last week, uh, gave back some of that. but. Uh, solid company as far as they pay a really good dividend. It added some good diversification in the consumer discretionary and apparel area of the portfolio. Um, and they also had a pretty good balance sheet as well. So long term, I felt good about the company. Picked it up at a, what I felt was a pretty good price point just before uh, it really took off with a lot of the other value names uh, when the Dow really rallied there for a bit. Uh, let's see, nothing changed in consumer staples. Uh, financials, I sold Wells Fargo. As soon as Wells Fargo popped up and I pretty much was break even on that, I got out of it. Um, Wells Fargo, I picked it up because they paid a really good dividend, but looking at the fundamentals, it's probably my least favorite of the big banks. So I just decided, and I don't like anything in financials right now, obviously with interest rates, probably gonna stay near zero for a long, long time. Um, I decided to get rid of that one and I kept JPM and Royal Bank of Canada, which is rocking it up there at 14 and a half percent. So that's nice. Um, healthcare, I don't think anything has changed there. I think I mentioned uh, last time, uh, picked up Medtronic and Pfizer and sold Glas Glaxo, Glaxo Smith Climb. Um, and then industrials, I picked up Emerson Electric. I talked about possibly buying Cummins or Honeywell. Uh, but one of the questions I have to ask myself before I buy, invest in a company is, can I see myself holding this for a very long time? And Cummins was not a company I could answer yes to because I really think in our lifetime that we're going to see most vehicles going electric, even big, large uh, trucks. Will there be a place for diesel engines? Probably, yeah, for, for our entire lifetime. But but that is really the, the core of their business model. So I chose no on Cummins, plus the price point got way ahead of where I really wanted to pick it up. Honeywell, solid uh, industrial conglomerate, probably the best dividend in that particular sector. Uh, but Emerson Electric, I think, was just a little bit better on the fundamentals and the performance side. And so I picked that up. Um, again, I was up a little bit more, but still still doing pretty good from that entry point, 14.5%. Uh, Delta Airlines, look at that, almost green on the position. Did go green for a bit, and then airlines pulled back, of course. Uh, let's see... Uh, I sold NRZ as well. NRZ was a uh, mortgage REIT. Of course, when I bought NRZ, it had a really high dividend. 
um, I knew that there was a chance that they wouldn't be able to sustain that dividend for uh, for a long period of time. But then the market really tanked, of course, in March and mortgage REITs really took a huge hit because there obviously there's fears that people wouldn't be able to pay their mortgages. Uh, and really, I invested in it without fully understanding the, the risk associated with the volatility in the mortgage REIT uh, sector. So it popped up. I was able to sell it for not as bad of a loss. At one point, I was down like 80% on the position. I ended up selling it for about a 50% loss, which of course I hated to do, but at least I recouped 50% of my investment and I can tax loss harvest it at the end of the year. So it's not the end of the world, but um, at least uh, reduce my risk on that particular holding. And then otherwise, uh, nothing else has really changed. I've added some more uh, money to the account, just depositing regularly to the account and really hoping that we get a bit more of a pullback continuation in the market so I can uh, start buying some more into my positions. But uh, that's about it. I added this up here that shows you the current portfolio yield. So it takes into account uh, my holdings and the weight of each of those holdings. So it will pretty accurately tell me about um, how much percentage my portfolio is, is earning every year. So just from dividends alone, my portfolio is giving me a 3.2% return, which is really, really nice. And then you add any potential market gains on top of that. And uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty good situation to be in. So pretty happy with that um, overall. Let me just check, uh, get caught up on the comments here. See if you guys have any questions. So Ross uh, asking every pick in your portfolio is based on what type of research. Give us an example of how you decide which ticker will go in your portfolio. So first of all, it is a dividend growth portfolio. So I'm trying to invest in companies that obviously pay a decent dividend, uh, but it needs to be a company that pays a very safe dividend. So let me pull up. Um, let me pull up Fidelity here really quickly and figure out the best way to do this real quick. So I'm going to have to obviously hide my account um, account numbers. Stand by, let me just do this really quickly. Okay. There we go. All right. So if you go to any company that pays a dividend, uh, let me just go to like Ralph Lauren, I guess here. So if you scroll down here, there is this right here. It says sustainability dividend payout ratio. So I want to look for a company that pays obviously a solid dividend, but I want to see how sustainable is that dividend. And usually when you start getting over about 50% on the dividend sustainability, you start getting a little bit concerned. Uh, I would say on the, the higher end, 65%, I don't want to see a company essentially paying 65% of their earnings to the dividend. So the higher that that number is, that's telling me that, you know, obviously they're having to take the majority of their earnings just to keep paying the dividend. And so that's more likely to see a dividend cut. So we want to invest in companies that pay a solid dividend, but pay a sustainable dividend and also grow the dividend over years. Um, that's first and foremost, if I'm investing in something that has a dividend, now, I do have some stocks in my portfolio that don't pay dividends for the growth aspect. For example, uh, the trade desk, right? That's a, a smaller company, but huge growth potential. Um, and then as far as the fundamentals go, I like to see a company that has a solid balance sheet. I don't want to see a company that basically has too much debt. I want to see that they have, um, pretty good, um, you know, pretty good, um, uh, assets compared to their debt. So if they're, if they're, you know, in really a lot of debt, AT&T is a good example. They have a lot of debt. Uh, it's a big company. You might say too big to fail, but there really is no such thing. Uh, but I'm still invested in AT&T. But ideally, you want to see a company that has really good balance sheet in terms of their assets and their debt, uh, sustainable in, in paying their dividend, and then also good growth potential. Um, and valuation is really the final metric that I look at because that's going to determine when I'm picking the company up. I don't want to be obviously buying when it's already overvalued. We'd be looking for companies that are already um, undervalued. And right now that's a little bit difficult to find. Everything's a little overvalued again. So we need the market to pull back to start investing back into some of these companies or adding to these positions.
So I'll just go to my portfolio here. If you guys are interested, um, I can just quickly talk about these accounts here. These are my retirement accounts. This one is uh, a Roth IRA. If you're not familiar, you can contribute 6,000 to a Roth or a traditional IRA here in the US. And these are pretty much just invest in, um, in index funds, ETFs. So it's a little bit safer. Um, you can see that I have like a total market fund. So it tracks small caps, mid caps, large caps, uh, international fund there, SPHD, pretty popular with the dividend investors. It pays a really high yield. So I invested that in my Roth IRA and then AGG is just like a, uh, a domestic uh, bond fund. And then I've got a simple IRA that's tied to my uh, small business that I own. So I can, I think I can withhold like 13,500 a month um, into this account, uh, or sorry, a year, 13,500 a year. So every month I withhold a certain percentage from my paycheck when I pay myself and it goes straight into this account. And it's the same thing, just investing in um, market index funds, uh, real estate sector funds, again, global fund here, and a little bit of bonds. So that's uh, that's pretty much it. We can go to the dividend portfolio here and take a look at all the positions. Um, it was really good like a week ago. I think it was up over $3,000 and 11% on the account. So that's, that was really nice. But of course the market pulled back. So I gave some back there. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to share this with you as well. So I have this spreadsheet and this is like an uh, investment allocation spreadsheet. So you can use this to determine um, how much money to invest if you want to do it kind of slowly over time or all at one time. So basically you input the stocks or the ETFs that you want to invest in here and then you give them a, a percentage allocation. Obviously you want to make sure that uh, they add up to 100%. And then right here you put in the account value so for example if i go back to fidelity and let's go to i think it's looking at my simple ira so you can see the positions that i have here and the account value up here so what you would ideally do is you come here and you put in the entire account value and then you put in the value of each of your investments if you already own them if you don't then it would be zero and then right over here, it calculates and tells you how much money you need to invest if you want to get it all invested at one time, obviously in one month, or if you want to take two months to uh, uh, invest that money into those positions, it tells you that here, three months and six months. So um, I'm going to make this spreadsheet available as well as my investment spreadsheet. Um, and again, I'll post those in the video description uh, once we're done here. So uh, let me check the chat here. Hey, what's up, Tire Man? Good to see you, buddy. It's been a long time. How you been? I've been really good. Appreciate it, man. Do I use only Fidelity for the research or other tools or fundamentals? Uh, Ross asked. So um, I do use Fidelity, obviously, but um, I was at one time using Simply Wall Street here. I had a, a subscription, but I decided not to renew it. Um, I just, you know, I had subscriptions to a lot of different things over the years and really just tried to uh, dwindle it down to the absolute necessities. And it's a really good website for doing research. You get like 10 companies you can look at for free. So for example, if we go and look at Ralph Lauren and uh, what I really like about it is the graphs and stuff that they show you makes it very, very easy to interpret the data so valuation is one of the things that i talked about obviously something to consider as far as when to buy it you want to obviously buy it when it's it's a good value and right now they're saying it's 39 percent undervalued uh it gives you a good representation of the pe ratio versus the industry and the pe ratio versus the market so instead of just looking at a pe ratio by itself um it gives you a little bit more perspective on the pe ratio and you can look at all of this. Future growth gives you an idea of what the, S the analysts are predicting uh, future growth to be over the next, I believe it's three years or something like that. Um, and you can see how that compares to the industry, the market. And then really one of the most important things if we're talking about long-term investing is we want a company that has a solid balance sheet, You know, a company that can survive, especially in the current uh, economic environment that we're in right now. Um, so they had a pretty good one, actually. Their, um, their short-term liabilities, uh, their short-term assets exceed their short-term liabilities. So we get green check marks for good things, obviously red X's for bad. Uh, you can clearly see their assets, although they are falling, obviously, 
uh, it's still still okay. Um, and then their debt to equity ratio is 43.5%. It is considered high, but you look at a company like AT&T, I think, and it's, it's like 200 something. It's ridiculous. So another good thing to look at. So you can see that this website is really great in terms of how they break this down and really nice um, graphics. And here's the dividend. Uh, I don't know why it dropped like this. I don't know. Did they cut their dividend? Not that I'm aware of. Maybe they did. I might have missed that. Yeah, it looks like they might have, huh? Um, well, traditionally, but that is to be expected, really, honestly. There's going to be a lot of dividend cuts coming, I think, still soon. So, uh, But overall, I mean, I'm uh, pretty happy with the portfolio. This is, a good, this is a good website. Another one that you can use that is free is... Let me just close Fidelity so we can get rid of these things here. All right. Uh, another website that I use for research for investing is Seeking Alpha. Uh, this one is totally free. And you can, of course, can come in here and look at any company. Um, as far as for dividends, they have a dividend section right here. And this will give you an idea. Um, here's the payout ratio that I was talking about. So like Verizon, 51 0.84% of their uh, earnings of the money that they make is going towards paying dividends. So it's, you know, it's, it's getting up there, but it's still acceptable. So you definitely want to pay attention to something like that. That would, that would be a very, very important thing to consider before investing in a dividend uh, paying company. And you can look at dividend growth as well. You, you can look at the, uh, ideally you want to see constant growth over the years and dividend history as well. So you can see how you know there's a lot of flat periods, but it is growing over the years. So this is a really good website for uh, for free that you can use for um, uh, doing this as well. You can go and look at financials, uh, just kind of get an idea of where they stand uh, over the past few years compared to current. Uh, you can look at things like revenue, expenses, all of this on here. But you can see that it's not as nice and pretty and easy to read as simply wall street but it is totally free so that's another um another option that you guys can use hey jet what's up man good to see you as well so i think that pretty much covers the investing side of things um so i think that's good the next thing that I was going to kind of talk about with you guys is, uh, or the, I guess the other spreadsheet I was going to share with you is this P&L spreadsheet. So this is, um, it's just a simple spreadsheet that I made that allows you to input your uh, your P&L every day um, as, the, as the months go by. So I created uh, tabs across the bottom for each of the months. So you can, you know, you can go in and input your, your P&L for each day and then it tracks it at the end of the week and then it totals it up for the whole month here. Um, right here, you can put your account balance, and this will give you your percentage return um, on the month for based on obviously your account balance. And I always try to keep mine um, right there, and then I just take out every month what I made trading. So I just keep it the account balance the same. So the percentage return is pretty much uh, always the same um, every month in terms of you know what I'm expecting to get on my uh, on my account. But I will again make this link available to you guys in the description below. Um, it's just a straightforward spreadsheet if you guys are interested. You need that? Cool. Morningstar, uh, Ross. Yeah, uh, Morningstar is good too. Yeah, I, I, I haven't really spent much time on it, but I do have that link saved. I've been over there before. So. Um, so I was going to ask you guys, what, uh, brokers are you guys using for trading? Th those of you guys that are, are live trading right now, what, uh, who's the broker that you're using and, and do you like them? I know a couple of you said that you went with, uh, with Lightspeed, So that's cool. E-Trade. How do you like E-Trade? And are you trading options with them or just stocks? Uh, trading view. Yeah, I've used it before. Um, you know, you have to pay for the, the subscription. So I ended up buying, um, uh, Edgewonk. So I was using, uh, Edgewonk because it's a one-time fee, uh, for the platform. And I really liked their analytics better than trader view, but I have used trader view before. It's uh, it's a good, it's a good website. There's nothing wrong with it. 
light speed, yep, yeah, yeah, light speed, and interactive brokers. So most of you guys who've been following me for a while know that I started day trading with interactive brokers and then I moved to light speed. So you use E-Trade and you are trading options, but you've noticed a lag lately. It's due to the volatility. Let me ask you about the lag, I'm talking about E-Trade. Uh, did you notice that this happened after the, everyone went to uh, free commissions by chance? Because I know um, a lot of people who trade with TD Ameritrade, the Thinkorswim platform, um, they said that after everything went free commissions that uh, they were having horrible lag issues. Uh, even just talking about order executions and one one person commented on my video saying that they they couldn't get out of a trade Which is just wild to think that they they couldn't close a trade So they're like taking a loss in this position and they can't do anything about it Had issues with lag on IB But overall was okay yeah, so Ross Edgewonk is really good. The only downside is it's not technically um, equipped for tracking uh, options trades. Um, I posted a video about it. I think you, you probably saw it, but um, I talked about the, kind of like the workaround that I was using and it works fine for day trading options. But if you're going to be tracking more uh, complex strategies that I've been using with my Tastyworks accounts, for example, you know, um, credit spreads and whatever stuff like the iron condors. I don't think it would really work for that. So that is kind of like the downside. You've only been a client since January, but yes, I've experienced that a few times. Yeah. So that was one of the things I wanted to talk to you guys about, and which is why I brought this up, because I do get questions um, about brokers, the best brokers to use. So you guys know that I used uh, interactive brokers initially. Um, and in order to trade with interactive brokers, you really have two options. You can pay for their their live data through them and use their platform. I forgot what they call it. Um, but the platform is just like, I don't know, it's like antiquated. It's like so clunky and I, I hated interactive brokers platform. Absolutely hate it. The charting is atrocious. Um, and it just doesn't, it just doesn't feel for, for very high speed trading, especially scalping. Uh, which I do a lot of obviously you guys know it just didn't seem like the best platform so I uh, paid for a subscription with Dash Trader and uh, that worked great I love Dash Trader some of the brokers that you guys might know of um, Centerpoint and when they were around sure trader they all use the Dash Trader platform great platform but you have to pay the fee or a monthly fee to use that platform that goes directly to Dash Trader. It's, it's totally separate from Interactive Brokers. So basically you're looking at, uh, for trading options, it's probably over $200 a month to, to access the Dash Trader platform plus the live data. Um, and that's money that you don't get back at all. Where Lightspeed Trading, they do charge you a fee for the platform and don't quote me on this because I think they did raise the fee, but I think it's $170 a month to use their platform but they will essentially um, waive the fee based on your commissions. So if you accumulate at least $170 a month in commissions, then the platform is technically free. Um, and for most people, that probably shouldn't be a problem. So for that reason alone, uh, made it worth a switch. And then on top of that, um, Lightspeed has been really, really great with executions. You can see in a lot of my videos, actually, most of the time, the second I hit the button, I'm filled. And not only am I filled like instantly, but I'm usually filled at a better price than the limit order I put out. Um, there's been so many times I can't even remember that I click the button to buy on the ask and I actually get filled like lower than the ask price. So that's very, very nice. Um, but yeah, I, I do get a lot of questions about what, uh, what brokers to use. And it, 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 you know, you can get away with using brokers like E-Trade, TD Ameritrade, certainly. Um, the free commission side is nice. I think they still charge uh, fees for contracts, though, when you're trading options. Uh, TD Ameritrade, I think it's 50 cents. Anyone who uses that, maybe you could tell me. But uh, I believe Lightspeed's charging me 60 cents a contract. And then Fidelity is also 60 cents a contract, if I'm not mistaken. So unfortunately for us trading options, uh, we're still stuck paying some commissions 
but at least they got rid of like the 495 per trade plus the 60 cents per contract or whatever it was so so you can get away with using free brokerages i know a lot of you guys uh who want to save money will go that route just be aware that especially since they went to the whole free commission thing that there has been numerous instances of people complaining of not getting fills um, or just you know sometimes just huge lag between getting fills and if you guys are trading anything remotely like i am that's a deal killer that just no it's not going to work not going to work at all so you kind of gets to you get what you pay for in, in some sense so and i'll just mention you know i you guys know i'm with lightspeed i'm not at all affiliated with them or anything so if you guys go join him, I don't get any kickbacks or anything, but I'm just giving you my honest, you know, thoughts on the platform and uh, overall the the brokerage. I can count on one hand how many times I've had an issue with uh, with orders or, or the platform. I think one time the platform they just had some technical issues and it wasn't able to really get on the platform and trade for like the first hour. That happened one time in two years I've been using them, and then like two other times I had issues getting an order filled uh, trying to buy options but it was because I had my custom command set up incorrectly so that was my fault so solid reliability all around in that regard so yeah Ollie yeah I did try IB using DAS I'm, I guess you probably heard that and uh, IB is great with DAS if you if you're willing to pay for the for the DAS trader separate from IB and just realizing that you're not going to get, you know, any compensation, you know, for commissions, you know, wave towards the platform like you will with Lightspeed, that's fine. The account minimum for Lightspeed uh, is 25,000. Um, if you're going to be day trading, it's 25,000. So I would really recommend at least putting 30,000 in because you don't want to be right at that limit. You know, you take one loss on the day and now you're under the 25,000, so. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really good executions. Um, so other than Lightspeed, what is brokers good for fast executions? Um, Interactive Brokers is not bad at all. Um, I, would, I would give Lightspeed a little bit of an edge. I probably have a little bit of a bias too, admittedly, but I would give Lightspeed a little bit of an edge in terms of execution speed. Um, but Interactive Brokers, especially if you're using Dash Trader, is really good for executions. Uh, completely doable for scalping, no problem there. Um, Centerpoint, I've never used them, but they're a major broker. Uh, they use the Dash Trader platform, and I know a lot of traders, uh, uh, popular traders, do use Centerpoint. Um, I'm sure that they have really good executions as well, um, or these guys wouldn't be using them. So again, I can't speak on personal uh, experience, but uh, Centerpoint is also good if you're interested in shorting a lot of like low float penny stocks. Uh, they're going to have shares probably more likely than Lightspeed will. That would be one kind of caveat to Lightspeed is if you are going to be shorting those really cheap stocks, they may not always have shares. So Centerpoint and then the other one, Speed Trader. I think it's the name of it. So those are really the top four, I'd say. Uh, Lightspeed, Interactive Brokers, Centerpoint, and Speed Trader. Uh, those would be the best four. I don't know if you can trade options though at Centerpoint or Speed Trader. You'd have to, you'd have to check on that. One benefit to Interactive Brokers though is that you can trade everything. You can trade stocks, you can trade options, and you can trade futures um, all with one broker. So if you are interested in trading futures as well, that's that's something to consider. Uh, what do I think of Tastyworks? I love Tastyworks. Um, so far, good little segue. I'll bring over the platform. Uh, you can see I'm up $192. I've taken four trades, I think, since I opened this account. And uh, as far as the platform goes, I love it. It's really great. It's really great for putting together complex options orders. Um, as far as day trading options, like scalping, I probably wouldn't love it for that um, because I don't have access to a level two here, an options level two that I'm aware of. Um, I don't have access to time and sales. I don't have any of that stuff that for scalping is, in my opinion, crucial. Uh, my scalping strategy with options, I have to have that options level two. You guys have seen my live trading videos, I'm sure. 
I'm always stare like when I'm in a trade, I'm staring at that options level two window. I'm looking at where the bid and the ask are flowing. Where are we kind of bottoming out in terms of the bid ask move? And then I'm watching the time and sales. What orders are actually coming through in the options that I'm looking at? Uh, and then of course the the underlying as well. I'm looking at the underlying level two. You don't have any of that with with Tastyworks. So if you're if you're going to be scalping options, I would probably not recommend Tastyworks for that. Can you do it? Yeah, sure you can. I mean, you can come in here and you can change this to uh, I think you just go here, just a long or um, yeah, just long put or call, and then you can you know if you're going to trade the current weeks. I think we change this. Um, I can't even do it. <laughs> Let me figure this out. Um, yeah, here, boom, All right. So you can do that, right? You can buy just a single call or you can move it over here and buy a single put, but you have to, right, if you wanted to buy that, you have to go to review and send and it's just not ideal for scalping, but for putting together complex options orders, love the platform, absolutely love it. Let's clear that out. We don't wanna be putting an order out there. Uh, let me see, what else are you guys asking? I like tasty work. Wait a minute, hold on. Speed Trader, Lightspeed Center Point, Cobra. Okay, I'm not familiar with Cobra Ross. I haven't heard of that one. But yeah, I would I would agree with all that. So uh, you said you like Tastyworks too. I'd say it's a good one for beginners. They can hold a little longer than just scalp. Yeah, definitely. It's still quick, but you have to click around and buy. It. Yep, exactly what I was just saying for sure. So if you're not, if you're a little bit of a slower uh, or a longer time frame trader, Tasty Works is no problem there. Definitely. Cool. Good deal. Okay. Um, I have a couple of questions I saved here, so I'll just answer these in the meantime. So this person was asking, so most of the money in options, um, so the most in the money option has the highest delta. If so, wouldn't that be the best option to trade? So I made a video, I'm sure most of you guys have seen it by now, talking about um, how to use delta when day trading options. If you missed it, I'll just quickly explain. Delta is one of the Greeks, of course, pertaining to trading options. And it's basically telling you how much the premium on that particular contract is going to change for every one point move on the underlying. So if the delta is say 50 cents and the underlying goes up, or okay, let me try it this way. Let's say you buy a call and the delta is 50 cents on the under, um, and the underlying goes up by one point, you're gonna theoretically make $50 on that call. Obviously options are priced on three different factors, so it's not perfect, but you can definitely use delta to determine about how much the premium is going to go up or down based on every one point move on the underlying. Uh, yes, it is correct that the most in the money options are going to have the highest delta, but they're not always necessarily the best ones to trade. One of my kind of, um, I don't have it written down, so to speak, but just over years of experience that I've been doing this, that um, the closer to expiration we are, I will trade more in the money and the further we are, I'll trade more out of the money. Again, though, we're always talking about day trading options with the current week's expiration. So for example, um, let me go to a chart for this. Might be a little bit easier. Uh, okay, so this is Friday on the SPY. And you know, it kind of rejected this trend line. So let's say that we see this rejection here. It's falling below VWAP and we think, all right, let's, let's buy some puts. It is Friday, the day of expiration. Now SPY, and I should mention this, that SPY contracts, they actually have several expiration dates during the week, so be aware of that. But most of the stocks we trade like Apple, Netflix, et cetera, they have just weekly expirations that always expire on Friday. Um, so it is Friday though, this is an expiration day for SPY. So let's say you're trading the current day's expiration. In this case, if you were taking this trade when it rejected this trend line, I would probably go with the three, 308 puts because it's right at the money. Um, if you wanted to be a little safer, you could go with 309 puts. The delta, of course, will be higher because you're going more in the money. Uh, but the reason that I do that on really Fridays and Thursdays is because of the time decay factor. So the options contracts get very, very sensitive the closer to expiration you get and the day of expiration, they're extremely sensitive. 
So if you're trading the day of expiration contracts, you can really get some huge wins and huge losses. So that's why I always kind of mention that if you're a little bit, uh, you know, not as experienced that you can always go to the next week's expiration when it is Friday um, and you'll still get some pretty good moves. Um, it's just a little bit safer in terms of the decay factor. So in terms of the question, um, the only time I would ever go, you know, deep in the money and not even really ever going that deep in the money would be on a Thursday or Friday. But Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, if this was one of those days and we had several days till expiration, for example, then you could go a little bit further out of the money. Let's say that you think it's at least going to make it to 305. You could certainly go with the 305 puts. So you still don't want to go too far out of the money, but you can go a little bit out of the money and be okay. So that was, uh, that was a good question for sure. Uh, let's see, what's the next question? All right, so they're using Weeble. They're ready to start trading at a higher level. And they deposit 25,000 at Weeble. What are the advantages of using Lightspeed compared to a free broker? So I guess we pretty much answered that. Basically, you're gonna get what you pay for. Um, a broker like Weeble is, in my opinion, not really, not really suitable, not really suitable to day trading options, at least the way that, that I really trade them. You can definitely do it. I know a lot of people trade options on Robinhood. More power to you. But I see these people are buying options like ridiculously far out of the money. And it's just not smart. So if you're serious about trading, I would really recommend you look at a broker that's going to probably offer better executions and a better platform. Uh, to be fair, I've never used Weeble though, so I uh, can't say for certain. Uh, so are your wins bigger when you take out of the money options? So yes, they can be. Um, if you take out of the money options, the further out of the money you go, the if the stock makes the move, right? So looking at SPY, if you took the current day's expiration and you bought the 301 puts and you can see it did make that move, the percentage return on those puts would be insane. You know. I don't know what it'd be. We could pull up an options chart and look, but it'd be hundreds of percent return. Um, in some cases, you can even get over a thousand percent return. Um, so yeah, if you go really far out of the money and it actually makes the move and it's really close to expiration, it, that's when you get a ridiculous like home run trade. But those are really what I would call a lotto trade because it, it really is a huge gamble. Um, so it's not anything that I ever do, but yes, uh, theoretically, the further out of the money you go, if it makes the move, you will get a huge return. But on the flip side, if it doesn't, the meltdown is going to be atrocious. You could really lose your entire investment. It could easily just go to, z to zero on you. So uh, you really have to be careful with that. Love to dip buy in Friday spy contract the day of expirations. Yeah, that's uh, dip buying anything on day of expiration is incredible. I did that on Apple on Friday. This was a beautiful, beautiful setup. This is a five minute chart, of course, but Apple, along with the rest of the market, sold straight off. Where did it come right into the previous day's low of day? Those those previous low of day, those previous high of days, those are bread and butter, man. I love those. Anytime you get a stock that gets an extended move, comes right into that level. It's, it's probably going to bounce off the level. We just don't know how much it's going to bounce, but it's going to bounce. So it's a high probability trade, especially if you have extension coming down in there. I think I was looking at the two minute chart at the time. Yeah, I mean, it's not super extended, but uh, the market was at the time. And I did take that trade right off of that. Uh, right off of that. That was really great. Oh, sorry. It was over here. Here it is. This is the trade that I took right into that low of day. And I bought as it was coming into it. You got the daily 90 EMA just underneath that. Uh, beautiful bounce right up into the uh, 5 EMA right there on the daily chart as well and took it all off right there as it came right up into the moving averages. Came back down, held a little bit of a double bottom you could say and actually gave a much better trade right here. But that was it. I was done trading on the day. But yeah, it's it's really nice to be able to do that. So in, in a case like this um, on Apple, um, I think I took the 335 calls because that was, yeah, the low... Uh, previous low of day was 335.50, I guess, 51, something like that. So I took the 335 calls because it was right at the money, just in the money a little bit. Um, and being the day of expiration, it's usually the safer play. So that was a good trade.
Robinhood and Webull are not good for day trading and trading properly, in my opinion, use proper tools for the job. Yeah, I would agree. Um, again, you know, platforms like that, if you're just, if you're just a buy and hold, that's fine. But even Robinhood, they had what that entire day that their platform was down. And I think there was a lot of people who they had puts on the market and they got smoked. The, I mean, that was the day what the, the Dow rallied like 2000 points or something. And Robinhood was down all day and they couldn't close their positions. Not good. Not good. You don't want that. Webull is actually solid. A lot of people think it's similar to Robinhood, but uh, yeah, okay, Brent. Yeah, I would agree with that. I've, again, I've never used Webull, but um, I have looked into it a little bit, and I would agree that they definitely have uh, a lot more tools and um, capability for trading compared to Robinhood. Um, so again, I've never used it. I can't speak on the performance of the platform, but if I had to choose between Robinhood and Webull for trading, I would go with Webull, definitely, from what I've seen. Good question. So the trademark asks, do I buy going into a level or wait for confirmation? So I talked about this in several videos, but yes, I will buy coming into a level. It really depends on how it comes into the level. Um, so if we go to a one minute chart, maybe it's a little bit easier to see this because uh, I will go between a one or two minute chart on my short time frames for scalping and uh, make sure this is it. Yep. So right here in this case, I did buy it into the level because you can see that as it's coming down here, we had three red candles coming straight down into the level and look how extended it away it is from your short term moving averages, right? Even if you don't have a five EMA on your chart, if you have a nine EMA, which I would definitely have on your chart, when you get that extension away from the nine EMA on your one or your two minute charts, um, you will probably have a big snapback rally. And what did we do? We snap right off that level. So it's a combination of it's coming into a very key level, a previous low of day, a previous high of day. You know, a lot of eyeballs are looking at that um, and, and it's extended uh, coming down into that level. And you wanna see that extension on multiple timeframes ideally, right? So you see this extension on the one minute chart, clearly extended away from that nine EMA high probability that it's going to at least bounce back up into the 9 EMA. So on a quick scalp trade like this, yes, I would buy it into the level. Um, there was a trade in the video I talked about, when was this? A couple days ago, when Apple came into its prior all-time high and I did not buy it. Uh, I think it was right here. Shoot, I can't remember. I made a video uh, talking about it recently though and Apple came into its prior all-time high and it just kind of trended into the level. So in other words, I didn't see that extension on the one minute or the two minute chart. So without that extension on those short time frame charts, then I'm probably not gonna buy it into the level. I need to wait for confirmation. But again, looking at the same trade that I took yesterday, right here it is on our five minute chart. Look at how extended we are away from the five and the nine EMA way up here. Okay, so this trade that I took, I bought as it came into this level. I think I had a couple of ads on it. I bought about here and I bought here and then as it was coming up, I bought again. So I, I went with 15 contracts if I'm not mistaken on that one. And it ripped straight up into the uh, the nine minute, uh, the five minute nine EMA. And that's where I was completely out of the position. It comes back down. I said to watch for a higher low somewhere over 336. It actually puts in a little bit of a lower low but it holds and then you get an even better retracement off of it. So the biggest takeaway though, if you're gonna buy into a level, you have to have that extension, um, especially on your one or two minute charts and ideally on your longer time frame charts as well. And that's going to improve the probability that you get a snapback rally like this. Yeah, if it's just consolidating around the level, it often looks better for breakout, breakdown. Yeah, definitely. And Netflix was a good example of that uh, two days ago. I think I talked about that uh, in that uh, video. Definitely. Um, let's go over to Netflix real quick. And that's actually a good example in terms of shorting too. Sorry, guys. Let me just get over to, I think it was this day right here. And I don't have it on the chart because it uh, would be the previous day. Yep, here it is. 
This was a trade that I took, and this is a breakout trade that I took that I almost never take, but right here at 440, right about this area, just under 440 a little bit, this right here was the previous high of day. So this was um, June 11th. So this right here was the high of day from June 10th. And you can see that Netflix is just trending up into the level, right? So if you were looking to short Netflix coming into, like I said, one of those key levels, a previous high of day, then I would want to see that extension to take it at the level without confirmation. And this is not extended, right? Look at the one minute chart. It's just trending up, right? It's not extended at all. It is extended here slightly from the 9 EMA, but not, not enough to take it into the level. So in a case like this, if I was going to short this, I would want to see, you want to see huge, big green candles. You want to see that extension. Otherwise, if you were going to take the short, you'd want to wait for confirmation and you never got it here, right? It pulled off the level, came right back up into it and trades right underneath of it. Right here, it breaks out above it and then boom, there goes the breakout and this, I actually went long. Um, on this breakout, just caught a couple of point move on it. Nothing big, just a quick scalp. But this is a good example of when not to take something into a level. Um, I wish there was something that I could look at with some really superb extension. So here's, this is decent. It's not perfect, but sometimes it's easier to see it on a two minute chart. That's why you wanna look at multiple time frames. right so look so you have these big green candles coming up it's getting extended away from the short-term moving averages so up here at the top of this candle it's very extended away from that 9 ema what happens boom huge correction right down into it now sometimes obviously it can keep going right so it's it's not something that you're always going to catch the top perfectly but it's a it's a game of probability right so if you're going to be shorting or buying something into a level the probability needs to be there that you're going to get that quick reversal move in your favor and you have to realize that you're trading against the trend so the most important thing about a strategy like that is you do not be greedy right you you you're only looking for this quick corrective move back into those short-term moving averages uh, remember you can always get back into the trade if it confirms that it's going to struggle there maybe gives you a, a higher low or a lower high to trade off of but when you're trading counter trend and you're taking something into a level, the biggest thing, especially with options, is to not be greedy. You're only looking for a quick corrective move in your favor. You can take your entire position off. Sometimes I will, depending on the sentiment on the day. Um, or you can leave a couple of contracts on and see if maybe you catch a bigger move. Sometimes you get a home run trade out of it like that. But yeah, you want to see that. You want to see that extension um, either way. Hey, what's up, buddy? Thanks for dropping in, man. Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, which time frames do I watch put higher weight into? So uh, that's a good question. Um, off of the open, I look at the one minute chart because obviously you're, it's, it's very volatile. The first couple of minutes, let's go to something like Apple here. Very liquid stock. Okay, so this is a two minute chart. I'll go to a one minute chart. Right? Okay, so off the open, I'm looking at a one minute chart because it's, uh, you know, obviously there's not much chart uh, really developed yet. So it's everything's happening very, very quickly off the open. It's extreme volatility. So I really wanna see that one minute chart. But as the day progresses, I would say, after the first 30 minutes to an hour, I'll start uh, switching over to a two minute chart just because it does cut down the noise by half. Um, and really, if I'm looking at a stock that has extreme extension, a one to two minute chart will show you different things, right? The nine EMA on a one minute chart is gonna be a little closer than it will on a two minute chart. And actually I find that using the nine EMA on a two minute chart, when you do get that extreme extension works really, really well. Again, I wish I had a perfect example for you, but let's just see what Apple looks like here. Um, so this is a two minute chart again. I think we just saw that. This is where I took the trade right here. 
But yeah, two minute chart, see how it cuts the noise down in half and you're able to see subtleties like this buyer's candle bouncing right off the 50 EMA right there. So they both have their uses. So I'll use a one or two minute chart for my short, ter short term time frames, and really just use those for entries, entries and for scalping. Um, five minute chart is really, really helpful for seeing a, a broader trend. And a five minute chart is really crucial for looking um, looking for that distance between the nine EMA and the five minute chart. So for example, this trade that I took on Apple, as I said, I took the whole trade off as it came up into the, uh, the nine EMA and the five minute chart. So that nine EMA is a very powerful moving average on your one minute chart, your two minute chart, and your five minute chart. Um, it also works great on just about any time frame, but in terms of scalping, it's really a super solid EMA to look at in terms of uh, where you can expect the snapback rally to go. So your first target on a trade like this that I took would be the nine, uh, nine EMA on at least a one or two minute chart. So if we look at the two minute chart once again, right? So right here, as this snapback rally comes up into, you've got the five and the nine EMA right there on your, uh, on your two minute chart. And then this, this uh, horizontal line right here, this is the five EMA on the daily chart. So if you were to look at a daily chart, this is where the five EMA is. So right as we are coming up into here, I'm taking profit. And then the last bit I'm taking off into that nine EMA on the five minute chart, which again was, sorry, it was right here. So it was up in three, a little bit higher, three, three, uh, 339, I guess. Yeah, 339. So really pay very close attention to where that nine EMA is on your one, two, and five minute charts for scalping. And then it has use as well on the hourly chart as well. So here's your hourly chart and you can see how it will interact with that nine EMA as well. Yeah, so the two, yeah, watch it after the open, definitely. What's the data uh, subscriptions for options and Lightspeed? So I pay $20 a month for live data with Lightspeed. So it's it's super cheap. I think, and I, again, don't quote me on this, I think the platform is 170 a month, but again, that is waived based on your commissions. And I always have over $170 a month in commissions, so I never pay anything for the platform. So really the only thing I'm paying um, every single month is $20 for the live data, that's it. So let me go back to the questions here. So they're going to be switching. George says uh, they're going to be switching from Toss soon. How is Lightspeed for scalping options? Also, what other brokers were great with option scalping? Again, I guess I already talked about all this, but uh, Lightspeed is great for scalping options. You guys have seen my videos. I always get very fast fills and usually get filled better than the limit price that I put out. Um, as far as other brokers for scalping options, to be honest, I have not scalped options with any other brokers. Like I said, I've used uh, interactive brokers prior to Lightspeed, but I wasn't yet trading options at the time. So unfortunately, I can't vouch for that, but I can tell you that a good buddy of mine, Moses, trades options uh, with interactive brokers, and he doesn't even use the Dash Trader platform. He just uses the... Uh, somebody, someone help me out. What, what do they call the platform that interactive brokers makes? trade station or no that's not it i can't remember anyways he just uses the interactive brokers platform for for day trading options and he doesn't have any problem with it so um tws trader workstation yeah okay appreciate it guys so um yeah it, it, and i think the interactive brokers probably has a little bit less in terms of minimums for opening an account so if you don't have the 25,000 to open Lightspeed, then Interactive Brokers might be a good uh, good option. So you could look at that. Uh, let's see, what's another question? So this was just a guy commenting on one of my videos on eSignal. He says, eSignal is a pro platform for day traders. If you have the money, it is what the pros use. He uses uh, Thinkorswim because my focus is to use my cash to build up my win ratio and PL ratio to consistency it allows me to buy the pro tools for trading so much of it is just personal preference and trading style so i brought this uh, kind of comment up because i do get a lot of questions about platforms that i've used um e-signal is a platform this is what you're looking at right here e-signal is a platform that a lot of pros use because traditionally they have incredible latency um, the platform itself has a lot of robust tools to it 
uh, it's a it's a great platform all around but I started having some performance issues with it um, I think it was February or March this year after I updated the platform to a recent update I was able to fix that update um, I updated it again and uh, did a fresh install rather and I was able to fix it so that's a good thing uh, but I get a lot of questions in terms of would I recommend it and really my answer is always is the price worth it to you if you're not making money trading then I'd say probably no I would not recommend it if you're making money trading then you still have to ask yourself is it really worth the cost and if they are having performance issues like I had earlier this year because of I don't know if it was on my end or theirs but it works great now but if they start having performance issues again then I would uh, I would definitely not be happy um, so you really have to you really have to weigh the cost of everything um, the thing about trading that I've learned is that everyone has their hand out and everyone wants money for something uh, everything from uh, trading platforms charting platforms uh, gosh news everything it's ridiculous not even and not even getting into learning how to trade educational services so it can get really really expensive when you start talking about all of the tools that you have access to and really when it comes down to it I've learned that you, you don't need all of that stuff you really don't um, the biggest thing that you can do is just use thinkorswim it's totally free um, I still use it. I still have it. My wife has an account there. I trade futures through that platform whenever I do trade futures. So um, it's, a, it's a solid platform. Again, it's totally free and you don't have to trade with them to use it for charting. Um, in terms of charts, Lightspeed charts are actually not that bad. Unfortunately, I can't pull up the Lightspeed platform. That And that really is kind of my biggest complaint about Lightspeed and really my only complaint is that you don't have access to the platform after hours so and on the weekend so if you are going to use lightspeed um, charts then just be aware that you're not going to be able to access those charts on the weekend which totally sucks um, your alternative to that is you can use trader view trading view i think i have it here so if you go here and here trading view um, you can use this for free and uh, or you can pay for a subscription to it but if you use it for free they will have ads on it but this is the alternative um, if you just want to be able to access charts over the weekend when light speed um, is not accessible but in terms of more robust platforms like I said if you're new to trading uh, just just stick with thinkorswim um, if you want to pay for third-party charting TC2000 is really solid it's not nearly as expensive as eSignal um, they have their performance issues too. Um, I've had days where the platform is laggy or it does some really wonky stuff like the candles will just start going up and down like out of just out of the blue like and it'll be earlier candles like it'll be right here during the day and the candles from the morning will start shooting up and down just like totally random. Um, it doesn't happen too often but just be aware that it's not it's not going to be perfect. I don't see any anything like that happened with eSignal but eSignal did have a, a brief period there where it was it got very slow after I updated the platform um, so that was that was a bit frustrating hey what's up pair me par me sorry if I said it wrong good to see you thanks for coming by why don't I trade small caps uh, I, I briefly mentioned that earlier in the video I started out trading small caps when I got into trading um, I actually was uh, introduced to trading my, what would he be? Uh, my stepbrother, I guess. My stepbrother, who lives in Minneapolis, uh, mentioned to me, I think it was over Christmas or something like that when I saw him, uh, like three years ago, um, three and a half years ago, something like that, that he day traded. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. I never heard of that. So then I went on YouTube and I started looking at, uh, you know, searching for day trading videos. And of course, I'm sure you guys can guess who the first one that popped up was. It was uh, uh, Ross at Warrior Trading. And I saw him trading small caps, making like bukus of money, making it look like so easy. And I'm thinking, man, this is great. You can just make money that easy in the market. So that got me interested. And um, I started paper trading trying to trade small caps and then I started trading real money in small caps and just I never found success and then I found Jeff with live stream trading and at the time I was actually just starting to 
uh, get introduced to, to trading large caps, uh, the, especially the beta names, you know, Apple, Netflix, et cetera. And I started having some success in, in those large cap beta names. So I never really um, applied Jeff's system to trading small caps, but I was able to apply his system to large caps with some pretty good success. Uh, but my style of trading is very different from Jeff's. So um, if you're interested in trading small caps, that's great. It's just not for me because I never genuinely felt comfortable investing in companies that are just, you know, crap companies. And really the, the final straw for me was whenever, um, what was it? Uh, LFIN. If you guys remember, if you were trading at the time, LFIN was a POS small cap company. One of the big runners that went from, I don't even know, like a dollar a share up to 50 something. I don't remember what it was. And it ended up getting halted. They did a T12 halt on it because they were going to investigate them for fraud or something. And I was looking at it the day that it halted. And I'm not even kidding. Like I have my fingers on the hot button. I was literally about to buy into LFIN when it got halted. And I thought it was just a volatility halt at first, but then it stayed halted forever. And then I realized that it was a T12 halt, which means that, you know, they're investigating, they're investigating the company for fraud. And that can be halted for months and um, they ended up delisting it and it went to, I think the pink sheets or something like that. And pretty much I would have lost everything. And um, you know, if you're trading with margin, you could really lose your ass off. You could lose not only everything that you had in your account, but if you're trading with, you know, four times margin, you could end up owing your broker four times what you had in your account. So that's when that happened, that was, that was the final straw. Never again, never touch small caps again. So, um, I just, you know, I just never feel comfortable putting money in a company, even though I'm only in for a very short period of time. Um, psychologically, you know, that's everything in trading. If you're not comfortable, you're going to make horrible decisions. And so I realized that I was never comfortable trading small caps. Sorry, let me just get caught up on the questions and comments here. So Ross asked, what education services have I used since the beginning? Um, I've only used two services. I use live stream trading and trick trades. When I first got into um, trading, I watched just a bunch of YouTube videos. I watched at the time, like I said, when I first was researching trading, the first one that I, saw, that I found was Warrior Trading. But I quickly realized that uh, his style of trading was, it was never gonna make me comfortable. So I ended up, um, so I ended up watching some of his videos for a while. And then I can't even remember, I watched someone else's videos on YouTube. I don't recall. And then I found Jeff. I found Jeff at Livestream Trading. And that was right about the time that I was getting frustrated with trading small caps and just never felt comfortable with it. So I joined Jeff's service. And at the time he had a large cap room and I was trading with uh, a trader called Trader Addict in there. And he taught me some stuff. Uh, but uh, at that point is when I found Pat with Trick Trades. And he trades uh, pretty much all the same stuff I do, the large cap beta names. So I went over there for a while. I was actually a moderator there. And then we just had our differences. I went my own separate way. And I went back to Jeff with Livestream Trading to be able to just hopefully bring some of my knowledge in terms of trading the large cap beta names. But most of the people over there trade the small caps. So um, I do post in the chat room my, my ideas and things like that. There is a handful of us that do trade large caps and also trade options. But um, that's it. Yeah, just two services. <laughs> Justin says, never trade a, never trust a man with a beard and a bun. That's hilarious. Yeah, so true. So true. It feels sketchy buying penny stocks for me. Yeah, it, it does. And it, like I said, I mean, what's over 75% of trading is, is emotional, psychological. So if you're not comfortable, if it feels sketchy, why the hell are you doing it? You, ca you can't do that. You just cannot do that. And so that's really the point where I, I got, where I was asking myself, like, I just, every time I got into a trade like that, I'm thinking about how bad this company is. I've never heard of this company. This thing could go to zero. 
and you know to, to make money in the small caps you have to and i'm not talking down small caps i know there's plenty of people who make tons of money there's a really good trader in the room e-man solid solid dude he makes really good money trading small caps so you can do it it's just not for me and for, the reason it's not for me is because i never felt comfortable and if you don't feel comfortable doing something especially in trading use your best just not doing it um it takes time to figure out what you're comfortable with where your edge is but when you do that's what you want to focus all your efforts on i've tried everything from trading small caps uh, of course equity trading large cap equity uh, trading futures trading options and when i first got into options i actually didn't have very good luck with it um, because the whole time decay issue was hard for me to wrap my head around but I quickly fell in love with it once I gave it enough time and, and enough, um, you know, enough time for me to really find my edge in options. And my edge in options is finding extreme value, either on the downside or the, you know, the overbought side, and picking up those premiums when they're just dirt, dirt cheap. Um, and then the nice thing about the options market, especially when you're trading these large cap beta names, is that you can you can trade a lot more size with less buying power um for example on apple based on how much money i keep in my my account i could probably well i don't know how many shares on apple i could afford but i know on amazon i could probably afford to buy about 125 shares on amazon and so if you're buying in say 25 share lots what you're only going to get like four or five ads that's it until you're up to full size and then you're maxed out on your buying power that's not a comfortable feeling at all but with options Amazon contracts are expensive, yes, but not nearly expensive as buying shares of the stock. So with options, it gives you a little bit more, um, a little bit more, you know, uh, area to work, a little bit more room to work without having to eat into as much of your your capital um, and your buying power, I guess I should say. So that was a, that was more of a comfortable feeling for me. And then also the whole volatility factor with options is fantastic for scalping especially when you get those big snapback rallies. You nail those entries on those oversold conditions when you're buying calls or puts on the overbought conditions, and you get those huge snapback rallies that volatility just spikes and you instantly take profit. It's great. It's great. I love it. The only downside, though, to options is that um, really they work best on the big beta names. So there is a small basket of names, maybe like, 10 stocks i mean you can see my watch list over here this is it i mean this is the one i mean there's more obviously you can trade but these are the ones that i like to trade and actually i put beyond on here but i've never traded options on beyond but definitely apple amd amazon uh, alibaba boeing which boeing is sometimes not great but lately the volume has been really stupid so it's been great um facebook mu netflix nvidia and out of this whole list hmm if I had to pick a favorite, I would say, well, certainly lately, it's, it's got to be Tesla. Tesla is just incredible. Um, why you wouldn't be trading options on Tesla, I don't understand. Because the options on Tesla are absolutely incredible. Um, and then Netflix is good, but the volume is usually a little bit lower in the options market on Netflix. So something to be aware of. But usually it's a, it's a pretty good one. NVIDIA and Apple, very similar. Uh, extremely liquid options market. Usually very tight spreads. Um, so those are really great ones too. And then if you like trading the market, SPY options, uh, QQQ options, really good uh, really good there. But I prefer when I'm trading the market uh, to trade the futures. If I'm going to take, take a trade on the market, I'll, I will trade either ES or NQ because of the leverage in the futures market is a way more than even options and you don't have the time decay factor either. So that's nice. Big caps are more predictable. Um, he's asking, the trademark's asking big caps are more predictable. Uh, okay, so I assume you mean compared to small caps. Uh, I would say it really depends. Um, you know, traders like Jeff and E-Man that trade uh, very successfully small caps, they would say that small caps are more predictable because uh, it's all retail traders in small caps. You don't have the big institutions and the algorithms trading those small caps. So uh, in that sense, that's why that's where their edge is, right? They're able to 
capitalized from inexperienced retail traders in the small cap market. Um, where in you're trading Apple and all these, these big cap names, you're trading with institutions and algos. So when the institutions want to step in and buy that day, then you're essentially piggybacking on their plan because there is no retail trader out there. I can imagine there's not any retail trader out there that would legitimately be able to move a stock like Apple. It's just not going to happen. But an institution steps in and decides, you know what, I'm going to buy Apple today. You know that they're going to move Apple. So um, in that sense, you could say that it's less predictable. And that's one reason why a lot of these these guys that trade small caps, they don't like to trade the large caps because they they feel like they don't have an edge competing against, um, you know, institutions and algos and things like that. Um, my my thought on that basically is I feel like my edge is actually better in large caps, even though I'm trading against uh, algos and institutions and things. Because you just kind of learn how they trade. Um, you know, in small caps, for example, they can have a very, very tight stop. You know, like a three or five cent stop or something really, really small. And of course, they're looking for much smaller moves a lot of times. They may only be looking for a 10 cents per share move, which is not very much. But because it's mostly retail traders, they can usually keep stops much tighter. Where when you're trading large caps with the institutions and the algos and things, if you try to put your stop too tight, they know where retail is going to be putting stops and they'll dip it down to hit your stop and buy it right back up. So they'll dip the price down, they'll dump just enough to cause a, a spike down, for example, if you're long, to hit a bunch of retail stops and then they buy your shares back at that lower price and it comes right back up. So one of the things that, you, that I had to learn when trading large caps is to not be to not be so quick on the trigger to necessarily stop out of a trade uh, you essentially you need to wait for confirmation a good example of that is actually um, on Apple here let's blow up this chart and we'll just take a look at this let's go to a one minute chart because uh, I think most of you guys are probably using a one minute chart so right here no was that it we got the two minute after all here yeah, it was right here. So again, this was the trade that I took. I bought it into the level, just scalped this small move right here, right? And so what do they do? They bring it back down and it actually breaks this low, right? It doesn't put in a higher low. It's technically not a double bottom. They actually break the low and then it gets bought right back up, right? And then this candle looks like, oh, it's going to come back down. This candle opens, it comes down and it puts in a new low here because where did retail put their stop? Just underneath this low boom they just took out the stops right there and then bought it right back up so it's like it's things like that it's maybe not a perfect example but you get the idea right you you got to wait for confirmation if you're risking off of this level here at no point did you get confirmation that you should be stopping out here you want to see it break that level and wait and see what is the next candle going to do every single one of these candles technically broke the level but they got right back above it you never got a candle below this level, right? So that's why you wait for confirmation in large caps. Um, and and if you're you know if you're just putting your stop so close, you're gonna you're gonna get stopped out every single time. And I think that's why a lot of people uh, that try to trade large caps when they're used to trading small caps really have trouble with that because it's just the you got to give them a little bit more wiggle room, I would say. But for me, you you don't get those like those sudden just dumps that can happen when you have a retail trader who could easily move a small cap stock, right? You get a, a retail trader that has a sizable account and you're talking about a low float stock. They themselves, especially if they're running a whole room, could easily move a small cap stock, right? And that's just not going to happen in large caps. So <clears throat> Paramit was asking, I can only trade equities, not options. What strategies do you recommend to play on AMD, UAL, AAL, large caps, earnings? Uh, for strategies on earnings, I would recommend not trading earnings. Uh, I assume you're talking about taking a position ahead of earnings. I would recommend not doing that. That's just pure gamble. Um, if you're talking about the day after earnings, then obviously it really just depends on the setup. It depends on 
Is it gapping up on good earnings? Then you have a potential gap and go scenario. Um, I can't. Yeah, if you'd give me a, a specific example of, of something you traded, then maybe I could look at it and give you my thoughts. But generally, um, earnings I, are not my favorite to trade. When a when a stock has their earnings come out, usually, you know, if it's if it's a a big move one way or the other, then the next day is going to be very very volatile. Um, you're going to have you know, you're going to have the best of the best trading the stock. And so that really high volatility environment trading against the absolute best traders in the world can be very difficult. So sometimes, especially if you're new to trading, it's better to just avoid trading stocks right after their earnings come out. But again, it just depends. It depends on the setup. There's so much that goes into that. Where uh, Where is the stock in relation to where it closed the previous day? I mean, how big of a move are we talking about here? Um, and Fibonacci retracements are really helpful for that as well, where you can look for possible, you know, gap fills or partial gap fills where you might be looking at taking a trade. So again, you know, there's, there's so much that goes into it, but it's definitely something that, uh, you can do. There's people who specialize in trading just around earnings. Um, so, and, and if you can only trade equity, you can still trade uh, the large caps, obviously. Um, I know you like a lot of people like AMD because it's traditionally a cheaper stock. It's you know it's up at fifty three dollars now, but I remember when it was like twenty something a share. Um, and the cheaper stocks, you know, a lot of people I think get drawn to small small cap stocks because they are cheaper, so they feel like that's all they can afford. But we have to remember that these large cap stocks make much bigger moves. So you know we're not looking at capturing generally just ten cents a share. Uh, on a trade we're looking at capturing a point or more um, on these trades so you know if you're catching a bigger per share move you don't really have to have as many shares as you would on a small cap stock so you can still trade these more expensive stocks obviously i realize amazon is getting a bit more expensive uh over two thousand dollars a share almost three thousand dollars a share now actually at one point i think it was over twenty seven hundred yeah twenty seven twenty right there Incredible day there. So, um, yeah, like I said, if you if you traded uh, one of those specifically, let me know and I'll, I'll be happy to look at the chart. Ross asks, uh, have you tried trading stocks in play after the earnings or after an event earnings? Just yeah, answer that. Upgrades, downgrades. Uh, okay, so upgrades, downgrades is a good one. So part of my routine every morning, of course, when I come in, I flip through all of my favorite names here on my watch list and just look at how things are uh, moving in pre-market to get a sense of is it showing strength or weakness already in pre-market. Of course, I look at the market itself um, and just kind of get a sense of where that is. Uh, and then the next thing that I do is I look at the news and I'm looking to see if any of the stocks that I love to trade have any news in terms of upgrades or downgrades. Uh, if it has an upgrade or a downgrade and it's from a very reputable uh, company like Goldman Sachs, probably one of the top ones, Morgan Stanley, you know, the big banks, uh, you're going to put a lot more import into those than you would if it's, uh, I can't even think of one now, but so if it's some company you've never even heard of, some bank or something you've never heard of, I would put a little bit less import into it. But definitely, if uh, you know, if you come into the morning, for example, and Apple has an upgrade, and the daily chart isn't like stupid extended like it was here, I think it was actually upgraded on this day right here. Um, you know, if it's not like crazy extended, then I would definitely have a bit of a long bias coming into the morning, and would expect that any dips would get bought. Now, again, when we trade these large cap stocks, they're uh, they're tied very closely to the market overall because they have such a heavy weight in, uh, in the market itself that uh, if the market's selling off that day, like you know, like it did the past couple of days, really, uh, you can't expect that you're going to be able to take a long on the stock just because it has an upgrade. So you really have to look at how the stock looks on the day, how the market looks on the day. Is it going to support a move in the direction of the upgrade or the downgrade? Uh, and then, you know, kind of base your your trade off of that whether it's going to give you the conviction to play off of that upgrade or downgrade but definitely something that i always look for options are scalable absolutely yes they are that's really like i said one of the reasons i like options because they're so cheap relative to buying shares of these beta names so uh very very scalable 
The only time that I would say that you might run into a problem with scale scalability on options is if you're trading the likes of Amazon. Uh, because the contracts on Amazon in the money or at the money are pretty expensive most of the time. They're cheaper by Friday, but on Monday, the premiums are always the most expensive because remember the time decay really accelerates, especially closer towards the end of the week you get. It, it's, it's exponential, it's not linear. So um, I, I'm just off the top of my head, Amazon options on a Monday at the money are usually around 30 something dollars, probably right in that range. Uh, obviously that's gonna be completely uh, dependent on volatility and things like that, but that's getting a little more expensive, right? So you start talking about shelling out $3,000 for just one contract. Uh, obviously there's gonna be a lot of movement in the premiums on a contract that expensive. You could go further out of the money to find a cheaper contract, but again, you get into the situation where you go too far out of the money and that time decay becomes a bigger problem. So just always remember with options, the more in the money or closer to the money you are, the less time decay that you're gonna have uh, to deal with. Uh, further out of the money, the time decay is gonna really be bad. So if you buy an option that is just in the money and then the stock goes against you and that option is now out of the money, you'll notice that the premiums will accelerate rapidly in terms of the decay. So you can end up you know, taking quite a bit of a loss if you go too far out of the money and the position goes against you. So just, just always keep that in mind. Your fave strategy I can play on AMD or airlines. I don't trade airlines and I rarely trade AMD. I have it on my list because it is a highly uh, a high volume name. It is one of the beta names I would say. It's, it's my least favorite in the way that it trades. It trades very heavy. So uh, I, I use the same setups, guys. I, I, I trade off of levels, really. I'm a levels trader. Uh, you know, previous high of day, previous low of day, uh, pivot levels, right? So you see your pivot point study. Uh, you've got resistance levels and you've got uh, support levels, right? So here's your support level. Here's your pivot point right here. Here is your first resistance level. So I trade off of these levels, right? Uh, these are, I, I don't necessarily take trades off of pivot levels themselves, but uh, they are good roadmaps. They kind of give you an idea of where the stock might actually go. Um, but actually looking at levels yourself, go to a daily chart, for example, and find actual levels that, uh, you know, could be uh, areas to trade off of a uh, previous hive day like I trade I, I uh, posted a video last week maybe talking about the trade that I took off this previous um, all-time high right here on Apple on this day right here it dipped right into that prior high I'll put a line on there right there so on this day right here it came right into it dipped just below it reclaimed it and boom I was in the trade so look for those those pivot levels and then when you have the pivot point study on your charts as well it can kind of give you an idea of a roadmap of where it's likely to go but really previous high of day previous low of day i put a lot of weight into those levels especially because most of my trades are extreme short-term trades so i'm not expecting that it's necessarily going to be a huge reversal point off of that level but that it's going to interact with that level and that's really the most important thing that we're looking for we're looking for levels where we're most likely to see some type of interaction Amazon stay away too expensive. Yes, I would recommend that if you're new to trading options, I would avoid Amazon um, because again, they are very expensive contracts and it's lower volume. Um, you're, you're not going to have as much volume flowing through as you will with um, the likes of Apple and, and Nvidia and even Tesla. Tesla contracts are, are you know, a bit more expensive. They're maybe not as bad as Amazon, but they're, they're definitely more expensive now that it's almost a thousand dollars a share but uh, there's a lot of volume in Tesla contracts. And so one of the things that you can look for when you're trading options is which contracts for the current week's expiration are currently trading the highest amount of volume. 
Um, it, they won't always be contracts uh, at a strike price where you necessarily want to take the trade. Sometimes you'll see that the highest volume is being traded um, in a strike price that's further out of the money. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best strike to take, but volume is something very important to look at when you're deciding a strike price. And you'll just find that in general, Amazon is it's, it's usually very, very low volume and the spreads are usually pretty bad. So... really have not done well trading amd something about it yeah like i said amd it, I, I just don't know how to describe it other than it trades very heavy um i've i've traded it several times but my success rate on amd has never been that great um i would say apple has always been my most profitable ticker but since tesla has been so volatile for the past i don't know how long six months or so whatever when it broke out uh big time the options on Tesla have been incredible. So I think Tesla probably is my most profitable ticker at this point. But um, I would, yeah, I'd say a Tesla, Apple, Netflix, NVIDIA. Yeah, those are definitely my top four. And then Amazon is good too, but not for uh, beginners. So if you're, if you're new to trading, really the best stocks that I would say are Apple and NVIDIA because the contracts are reasonable. Uh, you can buy in the money or uh, just at the money contracts for probably, it depends on the day of the week, right? I mean, on Monday, they're going to be more expensive, but I would say on average around two to three dollars, maybe, maybe five, let's say three to five dollars probably. Um, so they're not too bad. They're a little bit more expensive now that, you know, Apple and NVIDIA are more expensive stocks, but they're not going to hurt you that bad and you can afford to uh you, you can afford to buy several of them and scale you know scale into positions which is really crucial so uh those are those are great stocks to start with and you know apple is one of those stocks that uh you know loves particular things like a double bottom where uh nvidia it doesn't you know it doesn't react as well to double bottoms a double bottom is a setup where you know obviously a stock puts in a low, comes up, comes down and tests the low and then holds it and then rallies. So a double bottom is a solid setup, but I can tell you that Apple loves double bottoms. Um, so that's uh, kind of little subtleties that you'll learn. If you trade the same stocks day in and day out, you really learn how these stocks trade. You really learn what they like and what they're most likely to do uh, because you just get so familiar with them. And for me, that comfort of trading you know, something that, you know, look at every single day, you almost really kind of memorize where the levels are because you're literally looking at it every day. It, it makes me feel comfortable where small caps is, it's always like you're, you're always chasing, like what is the, what's moving on the day. And for me, I just, I just, I just hated that. Again, I'm not trying to talk bad about trading small caps. There's plenty of people who have success doing it. It's just, it's just not for me. Um, and then trading options on the smaller cap companies is definitely a no-go. They're just too illiquid. You, you have to stick with the, the beta names if you're going to be trading anything that's remotely liquid. Uh, what about SPY? Aaron is asking what about SPY? Uh, in terms of trading options, SPY is great. SPY is very, very liquid. Uh, QQQ as well, very, very liquid options. Um, so you shouldn't have any problem there. Again, I mentioned it earlier, but I would just caution that with SPY, there's actually, uh, is it two or three? Is it, it's at least two expirations, two weekly expirations. So, um, no, I think it's three. It is three. So it's weird. So on SPY on a Monday, there is, I believe, and I could be wrong, don't quote me on this, but I believe on Monday there is a, there's a contract that expires that day, which is, is weird. And then on Wednesday, there's an expiration date. And on Friday, there's another expiration date. So uh, just be careful about that. If you are trading options on SPY and you, know, you all of a sudden decide you want to hold it overnight, just make sure that the expiration isn't going to expire at the end of the day. Um, I don't know why they do it that way on SPY. QQQ, for example, is the same as all the other stocks. You know, they have um, they have an expiry on Friday. So typically when we're day trading options, we're always looking at the current week's expiration. Um, if you are worried about time decay on the day of expiration, 
So for example, like on SPY, if it was Wednesday, you know, I might trade the next expir expiration date, which would be Friday of that week. So just, just be aware of that. But SPY, yeah, very, very good for trading options. Yeah, good to know your stock jumping around is very tough. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it's it's personal preference. Um, another thing that I found that you really kind of needed to trade the small caps is scanners, right? Um, trade ideas is a really popular one. I've had that before too. Again, that gets into the numerous tools that you, you have access to that everyone wants you to pay for in this industry. Um, and if you're trading the small caps, it's different every day. You know, generally you'll have a stock that has multiple days that it's in action, but it, it rotates. It's constant rotation in the small cap market. And in order to find a lot of these movers, scanners are usually very, very helpful. And so um, while Thinkorswim does have the capability of creating scanners and things like that, it's just something it's just an annoyance that i was glad to get rid of i could just have my watch list my small basket of stocks and i mean guys i'm telling you these beta stocks you you guys know who trade these they they move every single day i mean sure there's some days where uh it's mostly chop right um and that's usually days when the market is chopping uh maybe there was a big move and it just needs to relax a little bit so there's some days where i didn't trade um, you know, if I pull up my, my P and L here, like I've traded every day this month, but like, I didn't trade Friday of last month. Uh, this day it was closed. I didn't, uh, that, that was not, so I traded every day in April, right? So, I mean, there's some days that I won't trade. I trade almost every single day because literally there's opportunities in these, in these beta names almost every single day. Um, but yeah, definitely, uh, definitely love that. So trade zero, uh, what did you say? They dropped it to 59 cents per contract. I want to get started with options, but not sure how. So you're with trade zero and you want to get started with options, but you're not sure how. Can you elaborate? Like what, what are you not sure of? Like as far as getting set up with a broker or just how to trade them? I'll be happy to answer that question. In the meantime, let me just finish up with these questions that I had here. Uh, how is light speed for shorts? Robert was asking and I, I did touch on that basically if you're looking to trade small cap stocks You know the really low float penny stocks. I would say light speed is not great for shorts um, I know garage day trader uh, Justin was in the room earlier uh, really good uh, really good trader He trades a lot of stuff that's moving. He uses scanners uh, Intensity scanners or something like that go check out his channel. It's a garage day trader he um he trades some some of those stocks that are I'd say on the cheaper end, and he's using Lightspeed, and generally he seems to never have problems with uh, with shares to short. But the extreme cheap stocks, like a dollar or less, Lightspeed's probably not going to have shares to short. The better broker for shares to short on the the cheaper stocks, I know a lot of the guys at uh, Livestream Trading they use uh, Trade Zero, so that's uh, that's something you could look at. Um, and then Centerport Securities, I think, is probably also uh, a good broker for having shares to short on those really cheap stocks. But um, for your mid-cap stocks, your large-cap stocks, they always have shares. It's not a problem. Um, Stockboy had asked me, am I a day trader for a living? Um, and do I scalp with options? You guys know I scalp with options and no, I'm not a day trader for a living. I actually own a small business and I've been doing that for about 18 years. I got into trading uh, a little over three years ago, I guess now, and really was just focused on doing it as a side hustle. And at this point it remains just a side hustle. Um, I mean, you can see I'm not really making enough money yet to make a living off of it anyways, but uh, could I get there? Sure. Would I? Maybe. But right now, that's not the goal. The goal is just to just keep it as a side hustle. When you start talking about trying to quit your nine to five and, and make a living exclusively from trading, it's going to bring a whole nother level of emotions to the situation. Um, now, all of a sudden, uh, you feel the, uh, the need to perform, if you will, right? Because with this job, there's no guarantee that we get a paycheck at the end of the day. Uh, in fact, we can actually lose money. <laughs> so 
uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's something that you have to work up to. It's going to take a lot of time, many years of trading before you could ever think about really going full time. Everyone is different, but no, I don't trade full time for a living. Um, and that's not really the goal, at least at this point in time. Uh, this was a good question. How do you get a demo for Lightspeed? They were commenting on one of the earlier videos when I was switching to Lightspeed, I was using a demo account. So if you are interested in Lightspeed, again, I'm not affiliated with them or anything, but if you go to their website, uh, you can reach out and request a demo. And I think they give you like a week to use the demo platform. Uh, it's like 15 minutes delayed data. So, you know, it's not something that you could really use to trade with the market in real time but you can definitely practice executing trades in the platform um, and you can you know just experience the platform uh, you'll have full access to all the settings on the platform and things like that so it give you a chance to just try it out but uh, unfortunately lightspeed does not have any kind of paper trading capabilities to it um, they only have the demo and it's only available for like a week so you just have to reach out to them and they'll get that set up for you uh, so that's pretty much all the questions that I had that I pulled from some of my videos, just some of the common questions. Uh, really good, uh, Ariana. Yes, really good point. So they're saying the only thing they hated uh, when we had the sell off in February, March, of course, uh, I'll pull it up here real quick. We all know this this sell-off um the only thing they hated was that the spreads and the options got stupid expensive yes and do you know why that happened i i made a video talking about uh day trading options 101 uh used uh, a whiteboard animation so if you guys missed it be sure and go check that out because i i talk about in the beginning of the video what options are traditionally used for and options are really traditionally used for insurance so investors will use it to essentially hedge against their portfolio that uh, you know allows them to ensure their positions. So for example, if I had a position in SPY and I wanted to, when this big gap down happened here, let's say on this day here, I wanted to buy some insurance so that I could sell my shares on SPY at $325 a share in case this happened, you can buy a put or puts uh, however many you need to ensure your entire position. And uh, when this does happen, you can exercise the contract and that allows you to sell your position up here, even though it's trading way down here. So traditionally, because options are used as insurance for situations like this, when you have huge increases in volatility, which of course happens when the market sells off, the premiums for those contracts go through the roof because the people who are selling you those contracts are taking a lot of risk. Uh, they're basically, you know, they're going to be left holding the bag. They're going to have to buy your shares at $325 a share when it's way the hell down here. So because they're taking that, that increased risk with the volatility spiking like that, the premiums on contracts across the board went really expensive. The spreads got really bad. Um, so if, if we actually go and look, let me just, just a good point of discipline. Um, look at March. I only made $760 in March, right? I traded a lot, but look at all of my days are teeny tiny wins. Cause I sized like way down. I was taking like stupid small size. Um, and then on top of that, I was also at the same time, uh, managing my my investment portfolios you know every day the market was like literally dropping five percent it seemed so every day the market would drop another five percent i'm like all right i guess i'm buying more so i was so busy and so emotionally caught up in the long-term investment side of things in this whole sell-off here that i just really wasn't my head wasn't in the game to be able to effectively trade that and then on top of that you have the uh incredibly expensive premiums because of that increased volatility uh the spreads were atrocious like i mean at times i was seeing like four point spreads um i, I think netflix was one of the worst ones i saw i really wanted to take a trade on netflix but the spread was four and a half points so literally if i hit the ask on one contract 
I'm instantly down $450 just to get into the trade and it hasn't even shown to me yet if it's going to work or not. So uh, yeah, that, that definitely sucked. Um, I did trade some equity during this time. Um, I thought that this year would be the first year that I traded just all options, no equity. But during the sell-off, I did trade quite a bit of equity instead of options. Uh, the trademark, do I swing trade options? Yes, I'm getting into that. And that's um, part of this, part of my Tasty. That's what this is for. This Tasty Works account is for swing trading options. So I'm getting into, I, I especially like the idea of selling uh, credit spreads. So in other words, I'm... Uh, looking at capitalizing from the natural time decay of options so you sell a credit spread you collect a credit you can sell puts or you can sell calls and essentially you're looking for those contracts to expire out of the money and you get to keep all of that credit that you collected when you open the trade because uh, you sold those contracts while they were still worth something while they still had extrinsic value and eventually it goes to zero as they go towards expiration. So that's one of many strategies. You, you know, I've done an iron condor before. I've never actually uh, done a live strangle or straddle. I've paper traded those. I've never messed with the butterfly, but there's a lot of different strategies that I'm, um, that I'm learning and getting into. And that, that is the purpose of this account is for swing trading options. Um, I never buy uh, just a single call or a, a single put to swing trade. Um, I will either do some type of spread, like a vertical spread, a credit spread, something like that for swing trading anyway. So good to see that some of you guys were smart and sized down during March. Yeah, so obviously, I mean, there's a lot of money to be made in this right and i've i've always thought you know man when the market has this huge correction and we go into a recession i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna bank and when it actually happened it was a whole another story <laughs> it was scary so no i i didn't bank throughout this period uh i played it safe and really that's that's the name of the game is capital preservation you you guys need to survive long enough to be able to figure this game out because at the end of the day it is it worth it uh, you know, to, to bet the farm um, during a time like this when you could make a lot of money? Or is it better to be safe in an environment that personally I've never traded in? I've never traded in a bear market. This was a first for me, right? I wasn't around the last bear market that we had. So VIX was like 90. I was nuts. Yeah. So you took some losses um, during March, it looks like. Yeah, so for me, I mean, like I said, there were some days where I just I was I just wasn't feeling it, man. If you're if your head's not in the game, that's one of the things you need to ask yourself every day. Um, you know, and, and taking into account the market conditions is a big part of that. When you wake up and you're making your coffee, whatever your your morning routine is, you need to ask yourself, how am I feeling today? Am I rested? Is my head in the game? Am I still thinking about a loss from yesterday, the day before, whatever the case is? You need to actually talk to yourself. Don't just think it. Speak it out loud. Like, talk to yourself. You know, I'll, I'll ask myself, I'm like, am I, uh, am I in the game today? Um, did I have a big win yesterday? So maybe not even a loss. Did you have a big win yesterday? Then I need to be a little bit aware of that coming into the market because you can be overly cocky after a big win. And that's how you end up with a really big loss. So always talk to yourself every morning and ask yourself, are you prepared for today? And what level are you at in terms of risk? Are you prepared to put on your normal amount of risk? Or is this a good day to sit on your hands and be very patient and take the risk off? So on days that the market has a big gap, I, do, I generally turn risk off, right? I'm not gonna put a lot of risk on. Um, a good example is here. This is a big gap. That's a big ass gap, right? And and it happened back here too, right? We had you know, big ass gaps everywhere. So when the market gaps like that, either up or down, the first thing that I tell my, myself is I'm 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 taking risk down today because there's a lot of emotion 
on these big gap days. Um, in hindsight, of course, always being 2020, this was a gap and go day. The, mar the market internals were ridiculous. Let me pull that over here real quick, right? If we look here, this is the day that we're looking at here. Look at the volume, the breadth of this coming down. On the NICE, it was like negative 78, even lower, like negative 80 to 1. And just for some perspective, on a normal day, you might see the breadth something like negative 3 to 1 or positive 3 to 1 if it's a bullish day. This was negative 80 to 1. That's insane. Insane, insane. Look at the ticks, right? Look at the ticks on this day. This is the day right here. Every single candle is underneath the zero line. And look how many times we hit the, the negative 1,000. Typically, when you see the tick hit negative 1,000, it's extremely oversold. And usually you would expect some type of brief snapback. But look how many times, even though it snaps off of it, it comes right back down, snaps off of it. So how many? One, two, three, four, five six seven even dipping way below negative almost 1300 there eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen fifteen minute candles so 16 times the tick hit that negative 1000 on this day right here so this is a day that pretty much is telling you that it's going to sell all day long and that you should not be trying to buy dips so the market internals are a very helpful uh, Peter Resencheck shadow trader YouTube channel does a really great job of explaining this and this is where I learned about market internals from so be sure and check out his channel if you want to learn more about this but I use market internals to get a gauge of what the sentiment is in the market beyond just the technical chart because this is gonna tell me like is this a good day for me to try to buy dips if I see the market internals this bearish then generally on a day like that, I'm not gonna be stepping in front of something that's coming down to buy it into a level because it's most likely not gonna have much of a bounce at all. Can you trade? Sure you can, but those are the days that you're in and out, you're in and out because it's probably not gonna, it's not gonna bounce. So on days like that, every single pop you're, you're selling into, you're selling into. Just absolute incredible bearishness in the market on that day. So in my opinion, do I think the market will tank again in October when we get up to highs? Uh, in October, that's that's certainly a long ways away. Um, I think that the the market is certainly ahead of the fundamentals in the economy right now, but it's hard to bet against the Fed, right? As long as the Fed is continuing to prop up the market, as long as they're continuing to uh, you know, on this course of stimulus in the short term, for me, it's, it's hard to really shore the market. It's hard to really do anything like that for long-term investing. Obviously it's, you just stick with it. You stick with it. You don't try to time the market, but for, for trading, I, it's, it's a difficult call really is because is if they're going to keep propping the market up, then it's, it's probably you know, we're going to continue to see dips get bought. Does it need to pull back more? I mean, looking at the spy here, it got bought up into the close, right? Right off that 200 uh, moving average there, right? So the bulls are trying to defend it here. You've also got this trend line here, although we did break this trend line, right? So if we continue to come lower next week, I think it's realistic that we at least see the 50 uh, moving average here. Um, and then we've got, you know, some pivot support right across here around 275 area, 276. So it's certainly possible that the market comes lower. I just don't know that we're going to get back down to this low here. Um, I would I would say at this point in time, it seems unlikely. However, however, we are seeing an incredible increase in the number of cases now. So uh, coronavirus cases. 
So if that continues, if that trend continues and we start seeing, um, you know, lockdowns having to come back in, then uh, I'd say that all bets are off. The Fed stimulus is probably not going to stop us from coming back down to this low and possibly even lower. Um, but again, it's if right now it's just hard to bet against the market uh, when the Fed is just propping everything up. Uh, pair meet, you are asking, uh, create a free discord community so we can trade with you. I do. I have one actually, um, pull up, pull it up here for you guys real quick. So the link is in the description of all my videos and this video as well, but, uh, I have this, uh, discord here. So you guys can feel free to come over there and trade with me. Um, I'm in live stream trading, so I post most of my trading ideas and things over there, but I do post in uh, the channel as well for you guys. And really, it's just a, just a way for you guys to communicate with me, reach out, um, you know, post any questions that you may have. And uh, if I have a solid trade idea, you know, I'll try to post my thoughts in there and feel free to go check it out. Again, the link's in the description below. Um, Yeah, it's hard to bet against the Fed, yeah. So in terms of what the Fed is doing, I would be concerned more long term, definitely. We don't know what the what the you know, the consequences of all the stimulus is gonna be in the long run. So that's definitely concerning. But right now, short term, I think it's 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 hard to bet against the Fed. And, you know, if we come down into this fifty, that's that's an area that I would definitely be paying attention to. So we'll see how the futures open up here in the next couple of hours. That'll be interesting to see if we open with a gap or not. But so far, the 200 is trying to hold. So, um, all right, guys, I think I pretty much covered everything. We went a little bit longer than I expected, but I really appreciate all the questions. If I didn't get to your question, I really apologize. There's a there's a lot in here. Uh, I will make sure if you do have any um, follow up questions, you can post in my discord or feel free to post in the comments on this video. And um, I'll really try to get to those. If I, if I ever miss a comment or a question you guys have, I apologize. It's not intentional. Um, sometimes I just, just flat out miss it. But uh, like I said, the Discord channel is a great way to uh, reach out to me. Just tag me in the post. That way I get a notification on my phone. And uh, that way it would be pretty much impossible for me to miss it otherwise. But um, So yeah, I'm going to wrap it up there. If you guys uh, don't have any more questions. And once again, I will put the link... Let me pull that up real quick here. As soon as I close the live stream down here, I'm going to put the link up for these uh, spreadsheets that I talked about earlier in the video. So if you want to ac get access to the spreadsheet for my investment portfolio, um, as well as my uh, monthly P&L tracker for you guys here, I will put the link in the description of this. And I'll post the links in my chat room as well. So if you guys want to head over there, we'll, uh, we'll get that posted as soon as I shut down the live stream here in just a minute. But uh, otherwise, like I said, I really, really appreciate you guys stopping in. Uh, it, was a, it was a lot of fun. I was glad I was able to answer some questions for you guys. If you have any further questions uh, on a future live stream for me, just uh, save it and uh, I'll make sure to get to those. All right, guys. So thanks a lot for tuning in. Hope you have a good rest of your weekend. And uh, let's get ready to uh, get after the market next week on Monday. See what it uh, wants to do for us. All right, guys. Thanks. Take care. We'll see you, uh, see you next time.